Hi, welcome back to another one of our online lectures here in World History. Today in our Middle Ages unit, we're going to talk about the power of the church. One of the definite rises we see in this time period, and a time period really when very few things were rising in terms of empires and power, um, the church is the exception. Uh, the church really takes the power vacuum that exists in Europe and is able to expand its own strength and really become a dominant force in Europe almost as a political function, not just a religious uh, belief system. So uh, we've already kind of touched on a couple of Christianity related things, but we're going to talk a little bit more about the power of the church today. So our question, our constructive response question that we need to answer through this says, generalize the role of the church during the Middle Ages using specific examples. You know, we've already got Clovis, who united the Frankish people through Christianity. We've already got Charles Martel, who was a Christian hero by winning the Battle of Tours. And we've already got Charlemagne, who certainly built monasteries and, and uh, was a strong Christian himself. So those are examples we can already use as the role of the church. We can see leaders using Christianity um, and Christianity growing as a result. But we're going to see even more of that here today. So, let's look at Christianity in the early Middle Ages. As society withered after the fall of Rome, Christianity was a constant. Like I said, it, it never disappeared. In fact, it gained strength when really anything else politically um, or from any other type of purpose, uh, socially, economically, all, everything else was kind of fading, but the church was growing and it was always there. Popes and church leaders would be able to use the power vacuum in Europe as a way to expand the power of Christianity throughout the Middle Ages. And when we say power vacuum, what we really mean is you don't have a strong leader or a strong empire in place, so somebody eventually is going to step up and assume that power. That's really what we mean by a power vacuum. And uh, the church was really primed to do this, to really step up and assume a lot of that power that was really not uh, claimed by anybody yet. So Christianity was spread by a lot of different things. Uh, missionaries, missionaries are people who, who their purpose is really to spread Christianity. Uh, and they risk their lives to go out to all different areas of Europe, uh, Africa, and even Asia to, to spread the word of God. We already talked about Clovis. Clovis was very instrumental in the survival of Christianity. So uh, Christianity was sped, spread by Clovis when he united the Franks through the use of Christianity. Certainly um, when he baptized all his warriors and made the Franks Christian, that was going to really set a trend for other Germanic tribes to follow. Attacks by Muslims also spurred people to convert to Christianity. Sometimes Muslims were seen as the enemy, at least that was the, the way they were portrayed by some of the Christians. And the fact that Christians won most of the battles against Muslims seemed to be a sign that Christianity was on the side of right. Uh, that's just a view from the Middle Ages. So, what we need to start with here is the structure of the church. We want to see how the church is set up. And this is going to help us understand Catholicism, because that's going to be a major theme of ours over the next couple of units. So, the church had different ranks of clergy, or re religious officials. Essentially, if you worked for the church... If you were a priest, if you were a cardinal, you were a bishop, or you were the pope, you are considered clergy. It means you are a member, not just a member of the church, not meaning you attend there, but you actually work and actually perform sacraments and religious ceremonies. So naturally the pope was the head of the church, and the pope still is the head of the Catholic Church today. And I'm basically following this a uh, little T-chart or flow chart here to kind of give you an idea. But you see here, Pope is the head of the church. Uh, this is the, not the current Pope, but uh, this Pope before him. Uh, and then you move down to Cardinals. And typically what you see, Cardinals wearing black and red, or oftentimes very bright red robes. Um, kind of like a, the bird, the Cardinal. Then you go down to archbishops, bishops, and down to local priests. And local priests would be your priests at the churches in each individual town. 
Now, all clergy, including bishops and priests, fell under the Pope's authority. So you couldn't defy the Pope, you couldn't make new rules, you couldn't make new decrees. I mean, you basically had to follow the Pope's laws. The Pope was chosen as God's representative on earth. So for Catholics, I mean, God is number one, the Pope is number two. And uh, that, uh, especially in the Middle Ages, began to really take hold as uh, even some emperors were secondary to the Pope. So, but for most people, local priests served as the main contact with the church. You wanted to, uh, you know, talk to you, God, you wanted to confess, things like that. You would have to go to your local priest at your local church. Now, one of the things we've seen in the Middle Ages is religion as a unifying force. Now, we had just gotten done talking about feudalism in our previous lesson. Feudalism created division. And it created division because you had all these little manors out on the countryside. They were not unified empires. They weren't unified countries yet. Your manor is where everything happened. Um, so that people were all divided, almost like individual city-states. But they had church. They had Christianity in common. They all learned the same things. They were taught the same ideas. They read the Bible. Uh, so church teachings bonded people together, even though they were kind of divided by the feudalistic system. There's no doubt that Christianity provided people with a sense of security and a belonging to a religious community. Again, it kind of brought people together to believe in the same thing. Priests and other clergy administered sacraments, religious ceremonies. A sacrament is like a marriage ceremony, a baptismal ceremony, communion, thing, the ceremonies that the church, uh, we, we recognize that the church does today. And lay people could not, uh, could not administer these ceremonies. And when I say lay people, lay people are people who are not clergy. People who attend church, people who are outside of the church are called lay people. Of course, all people were subject to canon law or church laws. So if you were a member of the church, you had to follow the church's laws, and that came out of canon law. Education was uh, a big part of the church. Um, the church offered the only place in the Middle Ages to receive an education. And we've already mentioned this because we've already looked at monasteries and convents as vocab words. So we know that monasteries were religious communities for men. The men who went there, uh, men in monasteries, were called monks, and they gave up their possessions to devote a life serving God. And I, I make the point that here in the Middle Ages, not a lot of people would have had a lot of possessions. Obviously, most people were poor. But this is still true today. We still have monasteries. There's monasteries in Minnesota. Uh, and you go live a very simplistic life. You, you devote yourself to the monastery. Uh, might be helping grow the food, uh, cook the food, clean um, but ultimately, you are there to also help out in the religious ceremonies um, and uh, read the Bible, translate the Bible in some cases in the Middle Ages. So you needed an education in order to do that. You needed to be able to read and write. Now, in the Catholic Church, women have typically not really held as much power. That's, that's been a historic uh, norm within the Catholic Church. So you don't have a mixing of the genders here. So women or nuns who lived in convents instead of monasteries. This is the same idea, just a different uh, building. You can see monks up here. Monks typically wore the brown robes, sometimes even shaved their head, as we're going to see in the film Luther uh, in one of our next units. And then nuns typically wore the, the black uh, robes with the habit on the top. That's what you call this. Um, so that would be very uh, typical of monks and nuns. And you, you still actually see some of this today, even. Now, a lot of what the monasteries did, a lot of the procedures they had, came from this guy down here, St. Benedict. So St. Benedict gets, gets credit for writing a book which set a practical set of rules for monasteries. So if you ever hear of Benedictine monks, that comes from St. Benedict. Uh, those are monks that uh, follow the Benedictine order, basically those who um, follow the rules and go to monasteries uh, that operate under St. Benedict's ideas. Now, as the church grew, so did its authority. So let's talk about the far-reaching authority of the church. The Christian church was becoming secular. Secular is a new word that you're probably not used to hearing. It means worldly. Basically, it means that the church was extending its influence to all aspects of daily life 
especially politics. Typically, you'd think the church just handles religious affairs. However, at this time, the church started getting involved in everything. Economics, politics, social life. And that's what we mean by secular or worldly. They're, they're you know, definitely extending their influence into everything people do. Uh, one of the examples that can prove this of being secular uh, in the Middle Ages, one of the popes named Pope Gregory I used church revenues to raise armies, repair roads, and to help the poor. Notice how none of those say we're building churches or buying Bibles. It's, it's things outside the church. You don't typically think of the church raising armies. Uh, you don't think, typically think of the church repairing roads. Certainly we think of the church helping the poor, but this is an example of how the church is using their funds to go beyond the realm of anything religious or spiritual, and now they're helping the people in a lot of different ways. Another good example of this is the crowning of Charlemagne. So the church sought to influence spiritual and political matters when it crowned Charlemagne Roman Emperor in 800 AD. If you remember that story, I mean, it really is a big deal. You think about Charlemagne, the most powerful king in Europe, being crowned emperor by the pope, uh, now the Pope is showing, I have the power to do this. I have the power to crown you emperor. Basically implying, I have the power to take this away too. That's now a political matter. That's something the church didn't typically get into as politics. But that example definitely shows that. Now, there was another Pope who really figured out a really good way to divide politics and spirituality. Because if you have emperors that challenge the Pope, you have popes that challenge the emperor, you can have some major problems on your hand. It was Pope Gelasius I that had suggested that God had created two swords. Of course, this is all hypothetical. This isn't, uh, there aren't two real swords out there. But listen to this example. I think this is pretty genius. He suggested that one of the swords that God created was a religious sword, and that sword was supposed to be held by the Pope. The other sword was a political sword, which was held by the Emperor. The idea here is um, these two were supposed to stay in their own, own realm. So the Pope was to bow to the Emperor in political matters. So if there's a political ad, uh, matter, a, a border dispute, uh, something to do with military, um, the Pope wasn't supposed to get involved. So to let the emperor take those matters. On the other hand, of course, the emperor was supposed to bow to the pope in spiritual matters. So if there's some spiritual matter going on, talking to God, uh, interpretation of the Bible, a marriage ceremony, something like that, the emperor was not supposed to get involved. The emperor was supposed to let the pope handle that. And Pope Gelasius suggested if each of these men, and they typically were men, if each kept their authority in their own realm, the two could live in harmony. However, as we're going to see, it doesn't really usually work that way. Uh, this sets up an age-old conf uh, confrontation of church versus state. Who has more power? So unfortunately, the separation of church and state didn't always happen. All right, the emperor clashes with the pope. Uh, here's a good example of this. Uh, the church was very unhappy of something called lay investiture. Lay investiture is when kings started appointing church officials. Kings are not supposed to give away jobs in the church. Kings are not supposed to appoint priests. They're not supposed to appoint popes, things like that. But in the Middle Ages, some kings started doing this. Of course, the church was very unhappy because the church liked to promote from within and uh, choose their own uh, clergy. Well, there was a pope named Pope Gregory VII who banned lay investiture in 1075. You can imagine that's going to make some kings very angry. One king in particular, German Emperor Henry IV, was very furious with this decision. He wanted to continue to uh, give away church jobs. That's not something he really had the authority to do. Well, Henry demanded that the Pope step down. He was saying, I'm more powerful than you, you should step down. And Gregory used his biggest weapon against Henry. Gregory excommunicated Henry. Excommunication is the taking away of a person's right of membership in the church. Basically saying, you aren't a Christian anymore. It's not just saying you can't attend church. It's literally saying, you aren't a Christian. And if that happens, of course, you can't go to heaven. So this was a really, really big deal that the Pope could use if somebody was causing problems for them. Well, naturally, Henry's going to be upset about this. He's going to realize that, hey, no one's going to listen to me as a king if my Christian people 
can't follow me because I'm not a Christian anymore. So Henry went to Rome and approached Gregory for forgiveness and was actually forced to wait out in the snow for three days. And what this story proves to us, it proves that some emperors tried to influence the Pope, but it was really difficult to do so. Pope had more power. In this case, Henry really showed that uh, he was not the stronger leader here. So the power of the Pope was much greater than that of the German kings. And definitely we would see more of this in the future. Future kings would attempt to exert power over the papacy. Papacy is just the office of the Pope. If you hear the word papacy, we're talking about the, uh, the Pope. And these attempts would, uh, would weaken German provinces in Europe. If you get excommunicated, you're not a Christian anymore. And if your people are Christian, they're not going to take you serious. They're not going to listen to you. So that brings us to our result. Throughout the Middle Ages, the power of the church grew. It was able to provide unity, education, and strong empires, and even allowed popes to abandon morality and call for the bloody event known as the Crusades. And that's where we're going to go next, ladies and gents. Uh, we're going to talk about how the pope used his power, uh, basically, to tell Christians to go kill Muslims. And that's a violation of thou shalt not kill. All right, let's wrap up the power of the church by taking another look at our constructive response question. The question says, generalize the role of the church during the Middle Ages using specific examples. And really what we want to do with this question is we want to talk about church-related events. Uh, as mentioned in the onset of this lecture, we already have several examples that we could use even before we got into today's information. So we could talk about how Clovis used Christianity to unite his people. We could talk about how Charles Martel became a Christian hero by defeating the Muslims at the Battle of Tours. We could also talk about how Charlemagne, a couple stories with Charlemagne, how he promoted learning, built monasteries, and, and certainly promoted education um, and Christianity. But we could also talk about his story, how he was crowned emperor on Christmas Day 800, and that showed that the emperor um, was, you know, definitely not as strong as the pope. The pope had more power because he had the ability to crown Charlemagne emperor. So we've got those examples. Uh, within today's notes, we can certainly add several things. Like we know a little bit more about church structure. We know what the clergy is from the pope, from the bishops, all the way down to local priests. We could talk about monasteries and convents. Monasteries are where monks went to uh, worship and to serve God. And nuns did those same things at convents. Certainly we could talk about uh, the far-reaching authority of the church, uh, looking at how the church could excommunicate you. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things uh, looking at the clash between church and state. Pope Gelasius thought he had it figured out when he said uh, there should be two swords, one held by the emperor, one held by the pope, and they should keep their power separate. But the power of the church really starts to become very political and crosses those boundaries. Um, and that leads to some clashes that we saw in the notes today. So ultimately, we've just got lots of different examples that we can see uh, of church power and the role of the church in the Middle Ages. So you can take from any one of those, from this set of notes, certainly from our previous set of notes on Clovis, Charlemagne, and Charles Martel, uh, to write yourself a nice short paragraph on the role of the church. So that's going to do it for us here today. Hope you learned something. We'll see you next time.